So thank you, Sharmista, for inviting me today to deliver a lecture. I won't say lecture, rather I would say I'm interacting with you, you know, like sharing, yes, some, sharing some of the things, you know, what I think and what you think, you know. Lecture, mm -hmm. I don't say that this is lecture. See, knowledge is everywhere in my understanding and you all have different perspective, okay. So what I say, it is not like that. My perspective, my understanding is the only understanding, okay. So as for today, the lecture title, I do not know whether you have got the lecture, uh, the title of my lecture. So the role of context in interpretation, that is, that is the title uh, of my today's lecture, the role of context in uh, interpretation, how do we interpret C. Uh, so, what is the meaning there? So, anyway, so thank you so much, Sarmista and other teachers. And I got to know that uh, mainly you are teachers. You are also teaching in different different schools and different colleges. And uh, and so I am very happy and uh, that uh, I am interacting with you through this online platform. And so, if you have any problems, let's say it's something you do not understand, just you can simply, you know, ask me those questions, uh, you know. Uh, so, I'm happy to, like, uh, let's say, uh, answer your uh, queries and related to linguistics, not only related to today's lecture, anything, let's say, for that matter, related to linguistics and languages, you know. So, I'd be happy uh, to share my inputs, my views, okay. So, uh, now... Um, Talking about uh, speech today, uh, so let's. So I won't talk about much the introduction, but let me just simply share my screen and uh, what I'm going to talk about today. So shall I? Can I share my screen? Uh, yes, I think I can share my screen. Uh, this is. Uh, Just one second, let me share my screen and then Just uh, please hold on a second. I'm just trying to share my screen. Okay, so no problem. So can you see it uh, now, Shanmister? My uh, yes, sir. It's visible. It's visible. So let me just. Uh, yes, yes, sir. We can see it. You can see it. Okay. Now let me just make a slide from the beginning. Okay. So, uh, so the role of context in interpretation. This is the title of my lecture today and I do not know whether you have already uh, got this title or not but let's say this is the field uh, what you talk about this is pragmatics field you know pragmatics uh, like what is actually happening in the context you see so I try to explain this in detail and uh, very basic understanding about pragmatics and slowly and gradually I'll also try to see let's say uh, mm, the theoretical understanding. So main thing one is the basic understanding about uh, about pragmatics, and then little bit of theoretical input, and uh, how do we uh, look at the context? You see, uh, so how do you interpret meaning in a given a given context? You see, so so this is the title of my lecture. So uh, welcome you all. Uh, I think it is uh, in, in Jongkha. It is is it Tashi Delek? Uh, when you welcome people, it's Tashi Delek. If I am, is it Tashi Delek or something? Kuzumpo. 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 Pola. Yes, Kuzumpo. Kuzumpo. Okay, so also Zongkha, Zongkha is a tonal language. So sorry for my you know mispronunciation. Kuzumpo. Okay. Um, anyway, so welcome you all. Uh, welcome you all and. Uh, Let's say, so this is what Sharmista has already told you. I have been teaching linguistics and uh, for many years. And uh, anyway, so uh, 
just uh, skipping about the entire introduction part. Uh, in case if you have any doubts, clarification, my email ID is here. You can simply drop me an email. I would be happy to answer your queries or whatever, uh, let's say, you have in your mind. So my email ID is harimadabre at gmail.com. Okay. Now, uh, so now, uh, as I was talking about pragmatics, the role of context in interpretation. Now, if you look at this, let's a simple one cartoon picture here. Um, so it is a little warm. I could use some water. So let's say somewhere the context is given here, given some kind of picture is, but without this context, let's say we do not understand all. Even even this cartoon is also, maybe many people can interpret in a different manner also, okay. So it's a little warm, I could use some water, uh, water is also a bold, you know, here. So what do you understand by this um, cartoon, let's say. And I'm sure here, uh, how many people are present, more than 39 or 40 people are present, I'm sure that everyone will interpret this cartoon character in a different manner. Okay, so the context really plays a really important role and not only context, also individual person, the way we look at things also, we also interpret things in different manner. Let's say whatever I am saying today in, the, in this class, in the lecture, it is not that all of you have understood it in the same manner, okay, so there are, but there are some shared understandings are also there, it's not like that, you know, the way I would like to interpret certain certain things in my in my own terms and conditions is not like that because as a, as a society we also have to function okay so there are some shared understandings so there are some cooperative principles so I'll be talking about this cooperative principles now if you look at this you know this two sentences here it is hot in here uh, so it is hot in here we know that, let's say, in Delhi and uh, mainly it's very hot. But the meaning could be different. It is not only hot, it's not only a statement, it could be something else. Let's say I am a teacher, I'm talking about this and I have uh, gone inside the class and uh, simply looking at the students and saying it is hot in here. And looking at one student and the student had understood that Sarah is saying that uh, uh, Please uh, open the window or open the door. But I did not see it. I did not see that it is, uh, please open the window. But I simply said it is hot in here and looked at someone, someone. So, see the meaning is different. And we have different kind of interpretation. Try to understand that. I forgot the book, let's say. Even the, the statement is that I forgot the book. There is a literal meaning, I forgot the book. But let's say... Uh, someone saying it, I forgot the book, maybe he means to say something else. Let's say if a parent uh, is dropping his uh, uh, son or daughter in the school and on the middle of the road and the, and the son or the daughter says, Papa, I forgot the book. That means Papa is going to give a good scolding that how come in the middle of the road you are saying that he forgot the book? You have to let's be careful, I have to come back again and drop him in the, in the school, you know. So there are many things, I forgot the book, maybe in the school or maybe in the college or in the university, in the classroom, some classmates are saying, one is asking about, um, uh, do you have the book? One is, I forgot the book, but he has the book, but he's intentionally, doesn't want to give the book to the other friend and that's what saying, I forgot the book. So, there are different kind of interpretations could be there. So, let's say I am sorry also. I am sorry if I say it. simply I am sorry. So, you say sorry for what? For what reason? So, you need to have the context, you see. So, the context really plays a really important role. Without context, sentences are nothing basically, you know. So, now if you look at this, um, the next sentence, she is there now. She is there now. I am I'm, I'm 100% sure that to understand this sentence, she is there now, it's very difficult. She is there now. Who will say that? Who is this she? And there, who is this there? Like where? Where basically? There, it could be anywhere, let's say. And now is like what time? So there are three things. And in pragmatics, we talk about these three things. Uh, and this is the terms we use dictic category, dictic or dixies. 
Dixis is the pronominal system. One is personal Dixis. Let's say first person, second person, and third person. Here you are talking about the third person. She. So who is she? And the temporal. Temporal means the time. Now. And now is, as you can understand, it's a relative. She is there now. It could be t today, particular time I'm talking about. And there is also, it could be anywhere. It could be in JNU. It could be in Bhutan. It could be any other place, let's say. Depends upon. So, the context has to, has to be really important. So, today's class, mainly I'll be talking about the role of context uh, to understand the, how context plays really important role, to un uh, 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 important role especially uh, to, to you know, decimate the, the meaning, meaning part, okay? So, uh, now, as I told you that this is the field, uh, pragmatics, uh, especially linguistics, there are different branches in linguistics, so, um, so how context shapes meaning? So this is the field, pragmatics deals with that, and that's what in your course, uh, Sharmista, she was teaching, and she told me that, sir, uh, if you could uh, deliver few, uh, one or two lectures on these, uh, so I thought, okay. Uh, and this is somewhere, it's a little difficult for the beginners, uh, especially even the teachers also. So I thought of why not uh, talk about the pragmatics part, you see. And um, okay, so how context shapes meaning and these are the related fields, mainly the core areas of linguistics. I am sure that uh, Sharmista has discussed all these things with you and the major, major uh, core branches of linguistics, phonetics, uh, phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, these are the core branches of linguistics. And uh, so, and I think I'm sure that Sir Mr. must have uh, discussed these things: phonetics, sound patterns, phonology. Again, sound patterns, morphology. We're talking about the word structure, syntax, the sentence structure, semantics. We're talking about the meaning. In many books, you will see that semantics and pragmatics are related, but semantics and pragmatics not only related. Uh, in some cases, related, and in different cases. Uh, in many many semanticists do not consider the role of context we had seen you know so anyway uh, and some of the uh, some of the areas interdisciplinary areas of linguistics there are many interdisciplinary areas this time simply mentioning one or two computational linguistics neurolinguistics forensic linguistics and social linguistics and in related to social linguistics uh, in the next lecture i'll be talking about regional and social social variations uh, or varieties of language in the next lecture so um, so uh, this is the interdisciplinary areas and I think you'll enjoy that um, I'll try to give lots of examples from my field work from my own, own experiment and all okay and so that, that's the next class but today is mainly we're talking about the role of context in interpretations of how context shapes meaning okay so let's um, uh, let's uh, go to the overview of my lecture, overview of the lecture. So, what are the things I'm going to talk about today? Uh, so, mainly uh, pragmatics and context, let's say. So, the first thing what I'm going to talk about pragmatics since it's, it's, a, it's the first lecture. So, let me just briefly talk about pragmatics. What is pragmatics and what are the context? What are the types of context? I'll talk about that. And uh, speech acts, so we perform different kind of speech act, not only the aesthetic act, the different kind of speech that we perform and especially the theoretical understanding I'll try to provide you a little bit of theoretical understanding by uh, Saul and as well as Austin. Uh, so I'll introduce the speech act um, and what kind of conditions we need uh, to perform or uh, to communicate effectively let's say. So there are certain conditions so what we talk about felicity conditions. So, um, so or cooperative principles. We need to have some kind of cooperative principles. What Grice talks about those maxims. Okay. So why cooperative principles? Let's say uh, why cooperation is needed. Just try to understand that today in this lecture, I am just simply talking, and you are just listening. Let's say, and so there is a co cooperation. Cooperation is going on. There is understanding, shared understanding that so since I am I am teaching. Let's say today. So, you being a student or let's say being the listener, simply listening, not interrupting, not interrupting me, you know. So, there is a cooperation, you know. So, and in our daily discourse also, you will see that there are lots of cooperation going on between the speaker and the hearer. You can even understand that. So, what kind of cooperation is needed? Okay, what kind of conditions are needed? You know, so Grice talks about those as maxims, you know, so those cooperative principles and maxims. So I'll try to talk about uh, with lots of examples. 
and then discussion and conclusion so hope within uh, one hour i'll be able to finish and then half an hour i'll try to take your questions so this whole lecture would be one and a half hour and um, i do not know whether you have the patience or not but in jnu mostly uh, we deliver lecture um, it's for a two hours lecture you know so when uh, sharmista told me that sir you have to talk in one hour i said that it is uh, too little for me you see i need at least uh, two hours but i will try to cut it in a short uh, anyway so i think you will have the patience you know so anyway so um, so we'll have discussion and uh, then conclusion and any other queries you know so i will definitely try to answer so now as i told you what is pragmatics and uh, pragmatics as uh, is the study of the way people use language in actual conversation especially we are talking about actual conversation here and um, uh, just uh, so just one second something happened yeah fine so uh, uh, pragmatic study both how context helps to determine uh, my screen just uh, let me uh, just one second let me i this uh so pragmatics is the study of the ways people use uh, language in actual conversation and uh, as a pragmatics is study both how context helps to determine whether a particular utterance is appropriate or inappropriate and uh, Okay, fine. It's fine now. So, um, is appropriate or inappropriate as well as how changes to uh, context alter sentence sentences meaning. So, depending on the context, as I told you, that a particular sentence may have different kind of meaning. Okay. So, uh, so and when you talk about context, um, context, uh, it could be. the social situational and textual context and uh, so and when you talk about pragmatics the study of meaning in relation to the context in which a person is speaking or writing it's not only about the spoken things and also we talk about the written part as well okay so this is in brief what is what is um pragmatics now some things law okay Ah, it's fine now. Okay, so this uh, especially pragmatics, the relationship between language and context. Uh, uh, this is the field uh, pragmatics we discuss, and there is another field what we call discourse analysis. We also discuss the same thing. So I myself teach course uh, named uh, discourse structure. Um, so the way there we you know in great detail we talk about this language and context. Uh, okay, so. So it looks at ways in which people typically perform certain speech acts. Uh, so whether it is an apology, whether a request, or order, or uh, in a spoken and written discourse. It's not only as I told you that about spoken discourse. It could be as well as written discourse. You know what we write also, whether it's a, a short story, whether it's a novel, novel, and there are many other things we also discuss. Uh, okay, so. Uh, and we have seen that that why people choose to perform certain speech act in a particular way somebody uh, let's say it's a simple statement somebody makes a question let's say somebody request so why somebody wants or threaten so why people uh, perform certain kind of speech act in a particular way you know you see that many people there are some uh, politeness they are very polite and some people are very impolite so what are the reasons for this so what are the reasons for this so what kind of politeness strategies we involve also in a discourse you see politeness strategies when i am talking about language have different kind of politeness strategies so so something like um, even even if you even if you are talking about uh, your language jongkha in my understanding so even if you say hello someone kuzum uh, jangpol kuzum jangpo and kuzum jangpola let's say kuzum jangpo it's basically you're talking about uh, mainly uh, junior people you know but kuzum kuzum jangpola if it is basically elderly people or respected people am i right am i am i correct yes doctor 
Okay. Yes. Yes, yes, doctor. You are correct. Yes, 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 doctor. Yeah. So something like you see, uh, so there, is, there are different things. There are kind of politeness. Uh, so different kind of politeness traditions are there in the language. You see, and every language has it for that matter. Every language in Hindi for that matter. Uh, there are personal pronoun as I told you. There are so you in English. There is only one you. But in Hindi and many Indian languages, you have three you. Tu, tum, ab. Tu is very intimate. Tum is like less intimate. But ab is basically for an uh, honorific person, respected person. You cannot address your te teacher as tu or tum. So there are different kind of politeness strategies um, is there in the language you see. And uh, it is reflected everywhere. So people perform different kind of speech, or, uh, speech or across culture. Not like that. What is there in one culture, it is there in another culture. Not necessarily. So we need to understand the culture for, for that matter. Okay. And uh, so what happens when people do not follow culture specific expectations for performing uh, particular speech acts? And if people do not, you know, perform that kind of speech act, uh, people may be offended. Okay. Okay. How dare he doesn't know these things, you know. Uh, so, and maybe let's say uh, you are in, uh, giving an interview and uh, you did not speak the way they wanted you to speak and as a result you are not selected so you have to speak the standard variety for that matter you see not the regional variety even for your language let's say zonkha definitely zonkha is the national language of bhutan but at the same time if you talk about there are different kind of varieties of zonkha depending on different regional varieties so you have to speak the particular uh, which was the standard language you know and if you speak uh, whether let's say Zonkha is also spoken in, in, in North Bengal, North Bengal. I'm talking about somewhere, uh, somewhere in North Bengal, uh, in the Darjeeling part, you know, Darjeeling and even Jalpaiguri in some places, Bhutanese is spoken. So that variety is totally different. So someone is coming to Bhutan, definitely he has to speak the other variety, the standard variety of Zonkha. Okay, so. So, and there are different culture specific uh, expectations, uh, you know, so we all part from that kind of, uh, uh, you know, whatever the speech act, uh, we all know it. Let's say in India, if I am here in India, there are certain expectations. Bengalis have different kind of cultural expectations. Hindi, not built people who are in North India, they have different kind of cultural expectations. So, we have to follow those norms, okay. So, so let's say one of the things uh, mainly in India. Uh, we just sitting when elders are standing. So let's say elders are standing and you are younger. So it is not generally, you should not supposed to uh, sit. At least if you sit, you have to ask their permission. So may I sit? May I sit? I am not talking about your home condition, maybe in a new place. Let's say in a village setting, in a village setting, you have gone to a village and the village head or the panchayat uh, is, is, is standing, uh, panchayat is standing. And without asking his permission, he just sat down, you know, there. So maybe the village head or the panchayat will be that, how come this new person has come to my place and without my permission, he just sat down? So he may be offended. And I can tell you lots of examples from my own personal understanding. And because I have carried, I've carried out field work from different parts and nooks and corners of the country, especially India. And I know that cultural norms and conditions, you see. So, and, uh, and especially, and... Uh, and these are some of the things, uh, especially in India also, uh, the kind of rotten Indian caste system, we had seen that, uh, the kind of Dalits, or untouchables, uh, there are many untouchables, but because of Indian constitution, let's say, uh, so some uh, Dalits are panchayats, or village head for that matter, Pradhan for that matter. But somehow, if the Brahmins are there, so they are not supposed to sit. If they sit, uh, uh, they have to sit on the on the land also. These kind of cultural uh, things are there, you know. It's very rotten society, especially if you're talking about Indian caste system. You know the way they treat the lit or the untouchables. You know, so there are there are many things uh, I won't be talking about, and there are different kind of uh, different kind of uh, what I should say. Uh, in the newspaper also, you will see that uh, how the Dalits or the untouchables are treated by the uh, upper caste, so to say. Okay. So anyway, uh, not going into that kind of thing, but I'm saying that, uh, so your your parliament, 
your constitution may tell you something but in the culture there are different kinds of cultural expectation or cultural norms you will see okay so uh, so the relationship between language and context uh, um, and, and basically the meaning so but that's not really what the original speaker meant uh, so now you see that mainly um, especially in the newspaper especially in the tv channels you know the politicians mainly say that uh, yeah he has taken my uh, my you know things out of context you know and that's what we must have heard about this in many people they said you have taken this out of context you know so out of the blue interpretations so so we have to uh, once uh, one political leader he said boys will be boys uh, boys will be boys uh, you know so boys will be boys if you if you do not know the context and uh, uh, and the famous politicians he he made this comment and after that even he lost in the election uh, when the rape the rape cases were going on and uh, he did not support rape but in a way in a light manner he said that boys will be boys you know so but uh, that's what uh, the context really are uh, really important so we had seen that out of the blue interpretations and as a result uh, there is a mis misinterpretation so one of the jobs of pragmatist is to investigate the relationship between context and meaning so what is the relationship between context and meaning and as i told you that the context can affect an utterance's meaning so let's say this is the this is one sentence that as i am simply saying the bus was late so bus was late we all understand that the bus was late is a statement that yeah bus was late but let's say a teacher is teaching in the class and one student he or she is late in the class and he said that the bus was late it's basically an apology just saying that sir because the bus was late or maybe something else but maybe uh, the student is complaining complaining about the bus service or something very bad service or something you know so the meaning is basically you get the meaning from the context so maybe that student is complaining about the bus service or explanation why they are late followed by an apology okay so it's not only about the bus was late but something else okay uh so we need to understand that what people typically say and do as they perform particular genre in particular social and cultural settings okay we need to understand that okay and uh, so there are different types of context as i told you that uh, one of the context is um, what we say that linguistic context definitely uh, the context without language also uh, so language part really plays a really important role uh, so linguistic context is there and uh, so the situational context uh, so the world around us the situation let's say the if i say prime minister prime minister of uh, of india prime minister let's say in india i say uh, the present prime minister or the prime minister we i understand whom i'm talking about uh, i'm talking about narendra modi but in in bhutan let's say if i say prime minister so you all understand that the present prime minister of bhutan is lote sharing we all understand that what i'm talking about is in the case or let's say if i say chief minister and uh, especially someone in bengal talking about chief minister is definitely didi didi mamata banerji you understand didi and people understand didi also this didi is not only didi here didi is basically chief minister of uh, bengal you know so and dada if you know dada is on especially in cricket people used to say dada dada means that those days used to refer to saurav Gang ganguly i do not know whether then you know all these things or not but somewhere dada is saurav ganguly we all understand that you see so uh, let's say even talking about the kind of situational context the present uh, background knowledge we all have to have this so we know that uh, definitely bhutan is a um, is a democratic country but at the same time you have a, a monarchy as well the king is there in india there is no king for that matter you see so at the same time um, but we have president here so um, so the present present king you have side by side the present king okay so jigme jigme kesher uh, jigme kesher wangchu i think he is the, the present king uh, sorry for my mispronunciation of those names anyway so that's what i'm saying so we have to have situational knowledge uh, so if i say 
Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh, we know who is the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh, okay? So the social context has relationship between the people and their roles. So in a given conversation, what kind of relationship the people have? So what kind of relationship? Let's say I am a teacher, I am talking to a student. I am not only a teacher, but at the same time, I may be a father, I am a friend, you see, or let's say, uh, I am also a master of, let's say, my, whatever, my maid servant or something. So, we have different kind of social roles to play. I may be a son, I may be a father, I may be a teacher. So, we, we have to understand this relationship between people and their roles, try to understand this. And we all have different kind of roles in society. Okay, it's not only really one role. We, we, we have different kind of roles, okay? So, uh, related to the context, this is cutting what, so the institutional context, background knowledge context, we all have to know all that things, you see. And uh, co-textual context, especially talking about the text, you see. And um, that's what uh, I, was, uh, I was telling you. Uh, so, the background knowledge context, you have to have this cultural knowledge about the world, what is happening. Let's say, uh, nowadays, if, you, if no one knows about this coronavirus or COVID-19, he has to understand that what is happening, you know, uh, in the whole world. So, the interpersonal knowledge, what they know about each other, and there are certain norms and expectations of the particular discourse community, which we see, we have to, we have to know. So, so the contextual knowledge uh, also includes social, political, and cultural understandings. We have to have social, political, and cultural understandings that are relevant to the uh, to the particular communications, you know. And uh, and this is try, this try to understand. Uh, there are many people they say that meaning is there in in the word, or the meaning is there in the sentences. Not necessarily. I'll simply tell you an experiment that one person, especially in Agra. Agra near Taj Mahal, you must have heard about Taj Mahal, Agra, you know, so this, um, so one person, because many, many foreign visitors come, he thought of, he wanted to learn the language, see, he bought a dictionary, English dictionary, and he somehow, you know, just uh, jotted down all the words, learn all the words, do you think that he is able to speak the language, he knows the word and its meaning and some sentences, it's not necessarily, so, Word, so meaning is not there basically in the word or in the sentences. Meaning, you have to deduct the meaning in the context, let's say. So, if you do not know the context at some, it's, you know, it's, 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 at times it becomes very funny. Or maybe you are so incompetent. So, the context is really important. So, meaning is not something that is inherent in the word alone. Nor it is produced by the speaker alone or hearer alone. It is somewhere, it's, it's a dynamic process, you know, making meaning is a dynamic process and it involves a kind of negotiation of between speaker and hearer. So, there is a negotiation going on between speaker and hearer. So, especially in this class also you see, there is some kind of negotiation I am trying to do here. So, what, what are my understanding? I am trying to impose those understanding to you, you see. So, there is a kind of negotiation going on. And in the context of utterance and the context of physical, social, linguistics, uh, so all these things plays a really important role. And meaning is produced in interaction. And so this is the interaction going on, uh, though now it is one-sided interaction, but let's say after, after some time it will be uh, two-way tra traffic, you can speak, you know. So it is jointly accomplished by both the speaker and the listener, or especially uh, the writer and the reader. So, and meaning involves spatial, psychological and cognitive factors that are relevant to the production and interpretation of what speaker or writer says and what hearer or reader understand by what is said. So, it is the psychological and cognitive factors. So, there is something going on in our mind, you try to understand that, you know, and so, in, in order to produce uh, the sentences and other stuff, you know, so that is a... So, uh, now, this is where briefly I talked about context and types of context and now I am moving up to the next topic which is speech act. As I told you that we perform different kind of speech act, whether it is a statement, request, question, and there are different types of speech act uh, we perform in our daily discourse, in our daily lives, okay, and we all do it, you say, 
so 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 relationship between literary meaning the propositional content and intended meaning as i told you it is hot in here it's a statement but it's not only a statement you may have a different kind of uh, it may be a request also you know to open the window or to turn on the ac air condition if i say especially in the class it is hot in here and uh, there is ac in the classroom the students will let's say simply turn on turn on the ac okay so it is not referring to it is mainly not only referring to the temperature they may request someone to do something open the window or turn on the ac as i told you or meaning goes beyond what someone in a literal literal sense has said it okay so uh, so it's not only the literal meaning there are some other types of uh, things are also involved okay so now talking about speech act this is little theoretical part uh, I'll, i'll 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 tell you and some of the terms linguistic terms and these are the works let's say austin and sol 1962 how to do things with words and sol 1969 speech acts these are again the famous works and uh, so uh, so they argued that language is used to do things other than just to, to the truth and falseness of particular statements so earlier i just keep, briefly i'll tell you that what happened earlier people as people thought about that language is just what is for language language is for to give statement even in the philosophy that was kind of understanding we have so the logical positivism so something is simply stated or maybe something is a uh, false so that was there uh, the logical prevalent view of logical positivism so the austin and salt they thought of they said that it's not only about that language has there are different roles different functions you see it's not only about statement it's not about true and false it's something else okay so uh, language is always used to describe some facts or a state of affairs and uh, unless a statement can be tested for truth or falsity it is basically meaningless so that was the understanding especially in the philosophy i know i'm not going to the detail in the philosophical aspect but that was the understanding but austin and sal the challenge that view that say no somewhere you know language is not only about the truth and false things it's something else also so we use language to give orders to make requests to give warnings to give advice you know there are different things we perform in the language you see and it's not only the literal meaning so following this um, uh austin uh, as you, if you look at i am just repeating the same example it is hot in here so if you say it is hot in here that's the literal meaning uh, it is hot in here uh, we're talking about the temperature and uh, so austin uh, austin talks about uh, three kinds of speech acts uh, one is locutionary act and these are the linguistic terms uh, you may uh, like note down or think up uh, just simply remember those locutionary illocutionary and then another is parlocutionary so locutionary so locutionary act what is the locutionary act that is the literal meaning of the actual word or the actual sentence let's say so it is hot in here basically we are talking about the temperature that's the literal meaning but illocutionary act is speaker's intention in uttering the word so it is hot in here basically the teacher is requesting the student that please open the window or open the door or uh, turn on the ac so something in an illocution react so a speaker's intention in uttering the word or the sentence for that matter okay and the parlocution is something else so that is the effect part it refers to the effect Uh, this utterance has on the thoughts or actions of the person someone getting up and opening the window so there is a kind of effect going on so teacher is saying it is hot in here and the student has understood that yes sir is requesting me to open the window so there is a effect of the utterance and as a result someone is getting up and opening the window and turning on this so that is the parlocution react okay so this is happening you know i and all the times it happens okay so we say things and uh, people understand that we are trying to say okay so there are different types of act austin says that there are three types of act locutionary act illocutionary act and parlocutionary act okay so i'll give you more examples and also you can think about what kind of examples um, 
and you will tell me that uh, what is the illumination react and the polarization react okay so uh, now try to understand this uh, so the I'll, let me just give you this example uh, so the bus driver let's say bus driver especially in the school uh, uh, especially the bus driver and the, all the children are playing making noise and some of the boys or the girls they are outside the bus and uh, some of them are let's say uh, disturbing and they have to move for excursion or a picnic and the bus driver is saying that the bus won't move until you boys move in out of the doorway so we know the literal meaning locutionary locutionary act that bus won't move but the moment the bus driver say it, what could be the illocutionary act or what could be the parlocutionary act you try to understand this because as i said that it's a basically the bus driver it's a basically threatening it's not only statement it's basically threatening or making kind of order also and as a result what is happening uh, as i said i told the effect effect on the on the on the participants so what is the effect as a result the noise is stopped all of the boys and the girls they came inside the bus okay so these are the things happening you see uh, so illocution react um, so is not only making a statement is telling the boys to move it's an order try to understand this and parlocution react there is something else is happening the boys moving inside the bus so uh, so the bus won't move until you boys move in out of the doorway so as a result you have a illocution react and uh, parlocution react okay it is also performed so uh, now let's say another example if i say what are you doing tonight what are you do doing tonight one of your friend uh, calling you uh, at night uh, or maybe in the, in the afternoon or maybe somewhere around 6:00 uh, or 7:00 evening and so saying what are you doing tonight and you say uh, no i have my assignment to do and uh, the other person said uh, nothing else you tell me that mean what are you doing tonight is also an invitation that let's go for party you know so something else you see like we, we try to understand so uh, there are many things we do uh, so i have let's say that's what uh, what are you doing tonight one say that i have not finished my assignment that means he is not interested to go with that person so not accept the invitation so it is an let's say uh, invitation to some extent it's not only what are you doing tonight the literal meaning so the locutionary and illocutionary and parlocutionary things are also going on and answer to nothing special what do you feel like doing so that means the person the answer to the other participant accept the unspoken invitation and let's go and have a party you know let's a booze now drink you know maybe go for go for a restaurant or somewhere so so there are many things to understand um, now uh, how to identify this locutionary uh, uh, illocutionary or parlocutionary act uh, as i told you that the locutionary is like it's simple the literal meaning but the illocutionary the parlocutionary is it is uh, not simple but without context it is difficult so it is not easy but if the context is there you can easily understand it see and uh, so it depends on the stage in the discourse as well as the social context which uh, uh, which the person is speaking so you need to understand that and uh, the illocutionary force can only be determined in relation to what has come before and what follows so you need to understand the context what is there before and what is so rather than in isolation from the overall discourse so you cannot take some especially that part in isolation as i told you earlier that out of the blue interpretations you cannot do something out of the blue interpretation take some sentence you know out of the discourse and say that this is the meaning no you have to take it as a whole okay then you can understand it okay so uh, so what has come before and what follows rather than in isolation from the overall discourse so let's say another thing i will keep you in after class this is one sentence let's say teacher uh just i'm trying to give you the context now so let's say a teacher has entered the room and that room is also noisy so students are shouting making noise you know some people are whistling 
and uh, the teacher uh, take a duster and just knocks on the uh, on the on the let's say, table and uh, with angry face or also loud voice he says that i will keep you in after class if he says that you understand that uh, what will happen immediately there will be somehow it's not only not only a statement but something he is giving a kind of warning or threatening and uh, other thing is that silencing the students students are also silent because he said this oh maybe he is angry we are making noise and as a result teacher will uh, if, if the class is for one hour we have to be today more than one hour so as a result they are silent okay so the locutionary act i will make you stay in a school later than usual if it is one hour class it may be more than one hour locutionary it's a warning it's a threat i will keep you in after class that means a kind of warning also to the students and as a result parliamentary act as i told the effect effect on the students effect on the participants so as a result students are silent and we all do this kind of speech act in our daily discourse it's not only about you know english in your in your language you know zonkha or which of the language you speak for that matter we all do all that kind of speech act locutionary uh in locutionary and parlocutionary speech act okay now uh, when you talk about speech act there are uh, two types of speech acts we talked about direct speech act and another is indirect one and direct one is basically that we talking about the uh, literal meaning if i say this there is no intended meaning and uh, so and if, and the indirect one is like we have to understand the context and that's what really important you see and so that's what bbc panorama interview 1995 diana you know and she says that she says that yes i did yes i did means she said that yes uh, did you allow your friends your close friends to speak to andrew morton diana says yes i did yes i did that means yes she did there is no other interpretation you know so literal meaning is there but the indirect speech act is something different as i as i told you from the context you need to understand from the background knowledge from the cultural conventions you need to understand there are many things so this is quite different from the literal meaning of what we say so let's say especially in western countries and uh, uh, this is the term which is used and many idioms and proverbs have lots that kind of uh, that kind of meaning so somebody has invited you uh, in a party and say that uh, to bring a plate to bring a plate and to bring a plate doesn't mean that you are bringing an empty plate actually to bring a plate in english it is says it's it said that you have to carry food it's, it's, it's basically a joint lunch or joint dinner we all carry food so let's say someone and you know, not knowing this cultural convention simply bring or bring a plate what do you think what will happen to this so we understand all this you see to bring a plate is not basically to bring a empty plate basically to bring food so so there are so there are cultural uh, cultural convention to bring a plate basically to bring food to the party try to understand this and bring an empty plate to the party means like uh, something like you do not know it so there are some indirect speech act we perform and follow and we all know it and every culture has different kind of this norms Okay, uh, you will have to uh, whether it is different. Uh, as Sir Mister talked about folklore, uh, because I also worked in the area of folklore also, and uh, you will see that whether it's a marriage ceremony and other um, other kind of ceremony, every every communities have different kind of cultural expectations. You see, the marriage ceremony. I I remember the, the Toto community, which is there in Jalpaiguri. Toto community, what they do in India, especially at the time of Paris, what happens that you know people are invited, they come and have food. But Toto community, it is other way around. People come and bring food. So if there are fifty people or more than hundred or more than five hundred people, all of them will carry food. So they want to help the uh, you know especially um, uh, uh, brides brides father parents. why unnecessary load to the family so this is a very good uh, things especially we can learn from the toto community and there are many tribal communities 
in the world they have this kind of shared shared practices but on the other hand if you're talking about indian system at the time of marriage what happens that the dowry you know uh, 1000 and crore rupees ias and ips officer they say that 1 crore 2 crore and go on and on you know and so it's a very heinous kind of system anyway so what i'm saying is that uh, you have to have that kind of cultural norms we know all these things so to bring a plate doesn't mean that bring an empty plate bring a plate means that yeah you need to bring food to the party okay so can i bring something let's say especially in western country especially in india also let's say you are invited for a lunch or dinner and mainly the uh, guest says that can i bring something and uh, the host says that ah, no 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 just bring yourself you don't need to bring anything but host there is an expectation and this expectation i myself um hail from bengal um, bengal and as a result um, especially you must have heard about the bengalis are good sadmish uh, asar is a bengali then uh, they like rasgulla you know sweet preparation you know round shape so rasgulla so they like rasgulla and mainly bengalis they will carry some sweet rasgulla and when they are invited for lunch or dinner to another place but what happens if you are talking about uh, in north let's say i'm not i'm not saying that in north people don't bring but many people they don't bring so uh, host is saying no just don't bring uh, just bring yourself but there is an, in, an, an there is a meaning somewhere it is understood that yeah you need to bring something you know so so expect the guest to bring something especially in western countries wine a champagne you know especially in western countries you must have seen that uh, or maybe sweet especially in indian uh, context as i told you the rasgulla gulab jamun and maybe bouquet gift or flowers and um, so uh, something like uh, and this is the types of also etiquette we have to follow this you know can i bring something so there is a understanding you know and uh, so there is indirect speech chat uh, there are different kind of indirect speech chat is going on uh, and and that is where try to understand this if you are learning a second language whichever the second language whether it is english whether it's hindi or let's say for me if i'm trying to learn zonkha as a second language it will be very difficult for me because it's not only learning the language or the linguistics part because there are different cultural things up there and to master the cultural things it is very difficult that is where our problem at times you see um, i am own say it's our problem i also tell that those uh, english english or foreigners why don't you come and speak hindi like us they cannot speak hindi like us the way we speak the same way our english is different your english is different it's okay not a problem we have to be confident we have to be efficient so that we can communicate efficiently that's all we have to speak english in a neutralized accent even many britishers or americans the way they speak english many people they do not understand people from south asia their english is better okay so some people they say that you know my english is bad or poor or something so don't have that kind of tendency don't underestimate yourself that your english or your language is bad have confidence and speak if somebody cannot understand it is his problem it's not your problem okay speak it's good fluent and efficiently that's all anyway so so something like and it's very difficult for 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 second language uh, learners to understand the cultural norms as i as i told you and the cultural conventions so something like so the room this room is a real mess let's see if i say let's say my room or this room is a real mess my friend has come this not only room is a real mess maybe i am requesting my friend to come and help me and clean my room okay so Uh, and this is where we need to understand from the context so would you mind helping me move the table let's say i am a teacher in my i am inside uh, the classroom and i am simply saying that uh, someone one student or maybe just looking at someone would you mind helping me move the table and the student says uh, yeah i mind if someone says i mind or let's say not doing anything it is understood that the, the student will come and help me would you mind helping me move the table it's not only a question it's a basically a request or it may be an order we need to understand this i think uh, as the examples are clear to you it's so 
what I'm saying that we, whichever the sentences we are talking about is not only a statement, it is more than a statement. It could be a request, it could be an order, it could be a warning. There are many other things that are going on and we all perform all that kind of things uh, in our daily life and whichever the language it is, whichever it is the Zongkha, whether it is English, Garo, Santali, Bangla, whichever the language, okay? So, and that's what I was telling you, speech act and felicity conditions. And uh, so, as I told you, when I am talking to you today in this class, uh, it's an online lecture, but at least you people are so good, you are listening to me peacefully, there is no interruption, nothing, you know, I am thankful that nobody is interrupting, you know. So, it is understood that there are kind of things, cooperation is going on. So, you are, I am talking, you are listening, at least I expect that thing. So this is understood basically. So there is a, so to perform a particular uh, speech chat, there are some conditions we need to fulfill that conditions. And it is not only in the online lecture series, in our daily discourse, we all perform that felicity conditions, okay? So Austin, uh, that's again coming back to Austin, that say that, yeah, there are a number of conditions, generally accepted procedures for successfully carrying out the speech act. So there are a number of conditions, uh, so let's say, and we all understand this. Let me just give you one example um, from our daily discourse. So inviting someone to do a, uh, to a wedding. Let's say it is a wedding, marriage, and you are inviting someone uh, to a wedding. And then I can tell you about your culture or maybe our culture, also Indian culture. So if it is a wedding invitation, yeah, as you know that it should be formal invitation. It is basically formal invitation. Informal email, nowadays people have moved to email, but something like to simply send an SMS, here I come for my wedding, people will be really offended. Or e-card, people in the email, they attach an e-card also. That is fine, you know, printed, uh, printed, also take a snapshot picture and then send the email thing, that's fine. But sending a wedding, in, wedding invitation, basically it is thought to be very formal especially in Indian context and in your context also, I'm sure. And uh, and who is giving that appropriate person to use the speech act? Let's say, so bride, either the bride or bridegroom's family. So who is sending the invitation, either the bride or the bridegroom's family, bride or groom, elder, grandfather or grandmother. So the name has to be written, you know. It's not that... Uh, Bride's, bride's uh, friend is sending the invitation. Bride's friend is sending the invitation. You will be said, ah, he is sending me the invitation. He did not have the time to invite me. So, he will be really offended. Okay. So, there are many things. Um, so, this procedure must be carried out correctly and completely. Otherwise, we take it as a kind of offense. That um, So, the person performing the speech act must have required thoughts. So, you have to have that thoughts, feelings and intention for the speech act to be felicitous. And the condition, especially talking about the marriage invitation, who is, whether it is the right person and right place, whether it is the right place or not, and right time also, especially talking about the marriage invitation, tomorrow is the marriage and you are sending the marriage invitation, let's say, today at night, uh, tonight, let's say, you will see that, oh, they are going to get married tomorrow and he, he, he has uh, invited me today. That means uh, I am unwanted person. So, we all understand that if it is a wedding invitation, at least four or five days in advance, at least two or three days in advance, and that has to be given. So, that are right person, right place and right time. You have to keep those things in mind also. So, if these conditions are not satisfied, that's what Austin says that, there will be misfire. And case of abuse, if third condition is not met, and especially third condition, I'm talking about the right time. So people will consider it's a kind of abuse. How come you're sending me the marriage invitation in the last hour, in the 11th hour? Tomorrow you're going to get married and sending the marriage invitation tonight. So it's a kind of abuse. So this, this, the, these conditions have to be met, you know, right person, right place, right time, uh, you know. And now, felicity conditions, uh, so uh, appropriateness related to the context. So, so utterance is appropriate in a given setting. So, felicitous, uh, so which is appropriate, appropriate related to the context. 
and infelicitous that is that not appropriate in a context you see now let's say um, if someone asked asked me and uh, this is the question what do you do for a living so if you ask me sir uh, you know me what i what i do but let's say someone asks me i am in the train or maybe in the aeroplane or somewhere and someone asks me what do you do for a living and i say that i teach in jnu i am a professor in jnu if i if i say this that means it's, it's a right answer you see i teach in jnu the conversation is fine i am professor in jnu but let's say if i say simply say that uh, i have a job do you think that it's a right right answer what do you do for a living that means i do not want to reveal it somehow i am not cooperative with that person try to understand this you see and we all i do i have a job so what do you do for a living and if i have a job but in the first sentence if i say i teach in jnu that means i am very cooperative with that person also the person was asked me so that cooperation is needed okay and let's see if i say um what do you do for a living i say my interest is linguistics then like say i think actually i'm not interested let's say with that person and let's see if i say sahaj yoga is my passion yes sahaj yoga is my passion but not necessarily related to the context okay so that means uh, yeah maybe sahaj yoga doing sahaj yoga and you know doing something also you you uh, do you know and and or do your living that's okay but especially if i am teaching and teaching in jnu and saying all this b c and d that is not i am not cooperative okay try to try to understand this okay so something like so we need cooperation you know cooperation that kind of um, so felicity is property of utterance not a property of sentence and uh, judgments of felicity may differ from one speaker to another speaker as i told you that the felicity things may differ from one speaker to another and there are some general principles uh, that artists must follow you know to be felicitous that principle there are so there are many unsaid principles as i told you that we understand those you know and uh, i think somebody is trying to annotate it so please stop the annotation uh, okay now uh, so rules for conversation and uh, and this is where i'll just simply tell you rules for conversation so that see that's what you know we are binded by rules there are different kind of rules convention tradition you know in language as rules language as grammar even in your house also there are rules you know you have to do these you have to do that if you step outside of your house there is a traffic traffic rules also you have to follow green yellow red you know sports you know games you know everywhere you know we are bind by rules even the whole cosmos if you look at you know it's all bind by by the law you know law of the nature so the so there are rules everywhere so language has also rules and also we are talking about conversation the kind of speech chat we talked about even it has rules okay so so rules for conversation and uh, we all know these things there are many rules which are not written but these are unwritten and from our you know um day, uh, childhood days we have learned those things uh, nobody told us that this is where so you know that especially if you are talking to a teacher you have to show respect to a teacher or maybe your elder so this is what we all know or something you know and um, so there are different assumptions the premises emerged naturally within societies enable effective communication and these things as i told you it differ from one culture to another one culture from one culture to another culture so even if you say that let's say the saying namaste namaste is fine in indian culture but a handshake let's say handshake is not fine in many cultures especially in the muslim countries we talked about and uh, and especially in the western countries uh, it's not only really handshake they do this uh, simply you know a uh, slight kiss in your um, somewhere in the on, the on the cheek and something it is not permissible especially in indian indian setting you need to understand that so someone a foreigner from germany germany or from america he comes to india and tries to meet people with his own certain certain kind of conventions you know hello 
it's a Muslim woman and extending his hand and saying that, and after that, you know, extending his um, cheek also, you know, in order to uh, just greet the person. It's not good, you see. So I have to learn that kind of things, you know. So there are assumptions, there are premises emerged naturally within societies in our effective communications. So we have to follow those things, okay? Um, so now uh, this is where rise. Uh, that's what I'll talk about. This guy talked about the cooperative principles, and that's what the cooperation we needed. And so conversational maxims, uh, that's principles or maxims, what he calls maxims, which guide the conversational interactions of both speakers and hearers. So that is, it, it, it basically guides us. So let's say today's lecture I'm talking, so I should not talk too much also. Just simply talking about, you know, mainly one thing again and again, you say, ah, too much. And man, move on to the next topic. You cannot say, but you know, on your mind, you will say, ah, man, move on to the next topic or something like that. So something like, uh, and I cannot lie also. We understood that. So lying is uncooperative. Lying is uncooperative. So there are many principles which guide conversational interactions of both speakers and hearers. And mainly we do not lie. Many people there to lie, but intentionally they may not lie. Okay. So, so the cooperative principle, uh, as I told you, Bryce, uh, in his paper, Logic and Conversation, talked about it in detail, and mainly four uh, some principles of uh, cooperative principles, and uh, these are the principles. Maxims of quality, try to un um, understand, and maybe try to note down this also, if you are interested, and uh, we all follow these four principles, and at times we violate the principles, so maxims of quality, maxims of quantity, uh, maxims of quality, maxims of quantity, maxims of relations, and maxims of manner. So these four principles are sub principles. What guys call it maxims. Okay. So what are this? I'll just simply tell you what are this. So max Grice's maxims. Number one, the maxim of quality. So what is this quality? Honesty in conversation. That has to be honesty in conversation. So whatever I am saying, I have to be honest, let's say. I should not lie. Do not say what you believe to be false. If something is false, I should not say. Or people should not say. What they say, think to be true, they should say. Do not say. And what, let's see, do not have any adequate evidence. So it's better, don't say that. Okay, so that is the maximum of quality. So let's say today, especially in the class, if I do not have any evidence for that matter, I won't say because I lack evidence. You can say that, sir, what is the reference of this? So better I will skip the part. So do not say if you have lack of, let's say, evidence or adequate evidence. Okay. So that's the maximum of uh, quality. And uh, let's say, and the person who is uh, aware of the maximum quality smart person let's say every everybody does we all are smart we are born smart basically so especially some people who are uh, cunning or not smart they try to make us unsmart you see and uh, so anyway so so those smart people are aware of the maximum quality i may be mistaken but or end the sentence with a maybe that means uh, it's not sure about it but I may be mistaken or end a sentence with a maybe. And we all do maybe. Many times we do use. We are not sure about it. So other person will not feel about it. Our other person will not say that, why did you tell lie? At least, okay. He said, maybe, maybe, you know, or I may be mistaken. So, so that means the person is aware of the maximum quality. Uh, the maximum quantity. So the quantity is that make your contribution as informative as required. Do not make your contribution more informative than is required. So do not make your contribution, do not talk too much. So in this lecture, let's see if it's a one hour lecture, if within one hour I have to finish it. But the point what I'm talking about, I have to finish it. Um, whichever the, con um, so as informative as required, not more than, okay. So, um, so that is the maximum quantity. So I won't bore you with all the details. Maybe someone who is aware of the maximum quantity will say that I won't bore you with all the details. Let's say when I'm talking about maximum quantity, 
uh, especially in the introduction part i myself started talking about my what i have done when i joined in the university what i did what kind of scholarship i got what how many publications i have i started telling you all these things and more than 15 minutes i have taken that thing so you like oh my gosh this person is talking too much about himself you understand this so the maximum quantity so make your contribution contribution as informative as required do not talk too much about thing the point what you are talking about okay so that is the maximum quantity and the maximum relevance or relation uh, so this is what the third uh, third uh, principle sub principle or maxim be relevant make, make contribution that pertain to the subject of conversation so be relevant as i told you today i am going to talk about the role of context in interpretation don't you think i am relevant i am simply talking about the role of context i have not moved to something else the next class i'll be talking about the varieties of language so i'll be talking about varieties of language i won't be going something else i not won't talk about pragmatics in the next class maybe one or two point that's different thing so be relevant so the maximum of relevance be relevant make contribution that pertain to the subject of conversation okay so even in our daily discourse if you are discussing something this so discuss this thing this topic okay so the maximum of relevance we have to follow the maximum of relevance as well and uh, at times uh, we change topic um, and at times we change the topic as you can understand that change the topic using a device such as by the way for changing the topic we use by the way or anyway you understand that you know especially in english we use this and uh, maximum of manner another thing the fourth principle what is a maximum manner and here avoid obscurity of expression try to be simple avoid ambiguity be brief be orderly that is the maximum manner let's say i speak english the type of english where you do not understand and i give lots of examples and i use some kind of bombastic words which you do not understand let's say heavy loaded words so what is the need of those unnecessarily so my purpose here to make you understand what i am talking about you know using those bombastic words what is the need for those bombastic words unnecessary in my understanding so grand also said that avoid obscurity of expression avoid ambiguity try to be clear be brief and be orderly okay so that is the maximum manner so these are four uh, sub principles grace grace's maxims mostly in our daily discourse we follow it at times we also change it uh, uh, so this uh, may be one person who knows about uh, the maximum manner you can say that this may be a bit confused but uh, confused but uh, then he start saying that you say okay this may be a little difficult but let me explain it to you you know so that means he is aware of the maximum manner okay so these are four um, four guys um, this the uh, maxims uh, what i talked about today in simple uh, so one need to follow the maxim mainly in our daily life in our daily discourse we follow those maxims follow the sub principles and uh, so guys argues that we assume that the speaker is following this maxims and combine this with our knowledge of the world try to understand this we understand we follow the maxims and we also combine this with our knowledge of the world the context as i told you earlier knowledge of the world the background knowledge of the world to work out what they mean and by what they say okay so the guys maxims are there at the same time the context and the knowledge of the world are also there in order to get into the meaning okay and um, as i told you that the maxims four maxims are very much there but we flout the maxims at time we intentionally many people they tell lie also many people they are obscure also they are not clear and overlap between maxims at times happen this one and that one will go here and there as well it can, it is it is there so um so you flout maxims um, so infinitistic violations of maxims people sometimes violate the maxims 
at some point everyone told a lie and i th- i don't know whether i think somewhere it's a big lie or you know, so many people must have spoken or told a lie or at times when you were talking people many people they change the subject we do given too much information at times we give too much in, uh, information there is a term in english uh, it is called mansplaining mansplaining i do not know whether you have mansplaining is something like uh, and again it is also a gender uh, gender not neutral uh, kind of uh, patriarchal patriarchal terms many who uh, men they feel that women uh, women they don't understand many things like politics and other many other things and uh, as a result there is a term coined in english mansplaining mansplaining is something like explaining too much about something you know so giving too much information or say something confusing and at times we do something uh, confusing i was saying that obscurity you know um, is simple so it happens uh, at times people are not confident they do not know but they want to be sound smart at times there are many teachers i'll tell you and you also yourself is a teacher that if they do not know i answer just simply explaining something if they do not know and maybe at times the you know uh, scold the scold the children or scold the students there are many teachers if you do not know simply say i don't know i'll get back to you next next class there is nothing wrong so if you say something you know round around round way you know and uh, so that means uh, it's basically confusing okay so we all do things uh, we all do things in our you know like cloud the maxims so but the maxims can also be exploited or plowed in order to communicate indirectly so i talked about the indirect speech act there are many things the maxims which can be plowed as well uh, indirectly and uh, i just uh, give you one example uh, sharmista how am, how am i doing with the time how much is left sharmista i don't know i haven't seen the watch oh uh, sir uh... Yeah, we are going fine, sir. Okay, fine. I hope I'm, this is. I just finishing within five minutes. Uh, sorry. Okay, sir. No problem. Sorry to keep you waiting. You know, all all of you. You know, more than the intended time. Anyway, so the uh, let's see the recommendation later. So, as a teacher, and you are also teacher. Some of you are teachers, uh, and I let's say I write plenty of recommendation later. And the students going to abroad. You know, applying for. either fellowship uh, going to pursue phd in different places either this this university or that university now we we'll talk about our recommendation letter think about you as a teacher you're going to write a recommendation letter do you think that you will be writing everything every every details about the student 100% truth about the student or your letter would be in a way you know there are many things uh, he want to say in a indirect manner don't we do that we do it look at the recommendation later and um, we 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 so we do it and we do not hurt the sentiment of the student and neither you want to be very um, exp- explicit telling about the students maybe one student is uh, uh, talking about the time managing time not able to manage time but in a polite manner in a, in a indirect manner you have mentioned this in a recommendation letter okay so we all do flout the maxims change in the topic let's say change the topic why change the topic let's say uh, and we all do also when i was student we used to do talk about our teachers you know discussing about teachers that he is doing this he is doing that he talks like this he works like this you know and all that kind of things let's say two or three friends uh, standing in front of the gate uh, of, of the school gate or the college gate or university gate and uh, talking about the teacher and maybe mimicking the teacher uh, his style of uh, walking or something and uh, that time the professor or the teacher has come the other friend did not notice it you know so still doing the mimicry and then let's other friend all of a sudden uh, they are doing the mimicry thing see they talk like this to all that kind of things and then all of a sudden the other person said that 
you see um, i read this book uh, chomsky uh, chomsky is very interesting and other person what chomsky i was mimicking him then he realized that maybe uh, something else, else is you know so he will understand that you know so, so this is what i'm saying you know so we all change the topic uh, directly or indirectly and uh, and this is the field uh, if you look at sarcasm especially in, if you are in literature i am sure sarcasm many people are so sarcastic as if that their mouth is full of uh, cut you know full of um, uh, let's say kind of a pair of scissors the moment they speak you know as if like biting other people you see you should be in other way more compassionate you know so so many people are so sarcastic in their voice in the tone also and many people so irony in their voice also Uh, so what they say, but they mean something else, you know. So, uh, so we all do it, and especially the literature. If we talk about many, many uh, poet, um, novelist, and other people, they use this kind of different device, devices, irony, humor, and humor also in jokes. Also, you can see that in jokes also we do follow um, or cloud the maxims, you know, and overlap maxims are always happening. Okay, so. Um, so what we have discussed today so far um that's what in the right hand side you can see that uh, pragmatics and context uh, i think i am able to tell you about what is pragmatics and what is context and what types of context and i told you about speech act at least i talked about three types of speech act locutionary act um locutionary act elocutionary act and parlocutionary act also gave you lots of example i talked about the felicity conditions what are the felicity conditions um so the kind of cooperations we need uh, and those cooperations uh, we all understand it and uh, talked about uh, prince um, grice grice's maxims the different types of maxim at least the four four maxims maximum quality maximum of quantity relation and the maximum manner with all these examples and also how to cloud the maxims you see and so there are many things in pragmatics see this is a course we teach a course in pragmatics and i can tell you that i teach at least i deliver at least i can deliver at least 30 or 40 lectures you know in pragmatics itself so it's a huge field in one day i'm sure it's not easy to tell you to all about pragmatics there are many things i just simply mention about dictic categories dictic categories is one of the important things uh, personal dictics temporal dictics and uh, special dictics uh, there itself uh, so the pro pronominal system as i was telling you that you know first person second person and third person different languages have different kind of dictics you know for that matter a presupposition one of the things really interesting we talk about presupposition there are many things there are many verbs in this lang in languages let's say in english if someone say that uh, i pronounce you husband and wife i pronounce you husband and wife let's say uh, there are many performative verbs for that matter uh, uh, so um, only this person this act can be done by 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 father by 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 you know church priest i pronounce you husband and wife i cannot say it you know so there are different performative verbs so there are different kind of things you know a presupposition is going on in the discourse if i say have you stopped exercising regularly that means there is a presupposition i know you that you were exercising earlier regularly so there is a presupposition there are different kind of relationships are going on entailment relationship and many other things polite strategies are also one of the important things in pragmatics polite strategies as i told you that even talking about the face face value so looking at the face we can understand that whether the person is satisfied not satisfied so there is a positive face positive face value negative face value and there are many other things polite strategies can be discussed maybe in in one lecture and two lectures also so there are many other things i could not discuss but only uh, four things today i could discuss and i think uh, um, uh, whether it is you know, uh, understood or not but i try to make it simple did not make it more kind of you know difficult and obscure for you uh so thank you so much with your patience uh, these are the references some of the references there are many more references um, many more but uh, only few few from basic introduction to linguistics book and there are many more so thank you kadrin chela uh, is it kadrin chela in your in your language i try to google it uh, namaste uh, namaskar in bangla how do you say uh, thank you is it 
Hari Jela. You are okay. correct. Thank you so much. I tried to Google it. Thank you so much for your questions. Mm -hmm.